Hello, uh, my name is Jim Turk and I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression. And I'd like to welcome you to today's Center for Free Expression virtual uh, uh, conversation. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the future of democracy in the era of social fragmentation. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the territory in which I'm speaking to you today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I also want to acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsor for today's uh, conversation. And those co-sponsors are the Edmonton Public Library, the Milton Public Library, Penn Canada, the Thunder Bay Public Library, the Toronto Public Library, and the Vancouver Public Library. We're very grateful for our co-sponsors uh, help with these uh, events. This is a very difficult time for democracy. Uh, most immediately for all of us uh, is the Russian war on Ukraine. But there's such a pervasive threat to democracy. The annual survey of the Economist Intelligence Unit um, found that democracy around the world fell to a record low last year. It's been doing surveys of the state of democracy worldwide for almost, uh, I think, 16 years now. And uh, the number of people living in fully democratic societies dropped to the lowest percent in the history of the survey. Uh, it's, a, it's only 6.4% of the world's population is now uh, living in fully democratic societies. And, but even in those societies like ours, there's a palpable unease about what's happening uh, and what, uh, what's happening to democratic norms and democratic practices due to the serious social fragmentation and economic fragmentation and cultural fragmentation that we're experiencing. So today's panel or today's uh, discussants are going to look at this issue. Our guest today is Tara Henley. Tara is a Canadian journalist an author of a national bestseller titled Lean Out, a Meditation on the Madness of Modern Life. Tara's had a remarkable 20 year career uh, that has spanned television and radio, uh, largely with the CBC in Vancouver and in Toronto. Uh, she's written for the Toronto Star, currently does a book column for the Globe and Mail, uh, does digital uh, journalism and writes in numerous magazines. She is publishing her current affairs newsletter right now on, it's titled Lean Out with Tara Henley and on Substack. And I encourage you to uh, all to look at that and, and consider subscribing to, I find them really quite uh, informative. So welcome, Tara. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. Um, Tara is gonna be in conversation with Samir Gandesha. Samir is professor and director of the Institute of the Humanities at Simon Fraser University. He's written a number of books. The most recent is titled Spectres of Fascism, Historical, Theoretical, and International Perspectives. Samir is also a public intellectual who writes for the Vancouver Sun, the Globe and Mail, uh, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Open Democracy, amongst many others. Welcome, Samir. Thanks, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we're delighted you're here. So uh, for the audience, what we're going to do is Tamir and, and uh, Tara, Samir and Tara are going to have a conversation for 45 minutes to an hour, and then they're going to bring you into the conversation. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. So if while well, you're listening to them, if any question comes to mind that you'd like to ask them, uh, please just click on that Q&A button anytime during their conversation, write down the uh, question you have. And then when we get to the audience where, where uh, Samir will bring the um, audience into the conversation, he'll turn to Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator of the center and ask her to read out the first question. Uh, uh, Samir and, and uh, Tara will respond to it. Uh, and then we'll go to the next question and so forth until the uh, end of the event. So we hope, we hope you'll engage with us and, and ask questions that come to mind and participate in the conversation. 
Um, that's that's really um, uh, all I have. So over to you, uh, Samir and Tara. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, before I go any further, I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, uh, I live and, and uh, uh, work on the uh, unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. Um, Jim, I think you did an excellent job of uh, kind of framing our discussion uh, for today. I mean, democracy is clearly um, under fire. Um, it's under uh, a, a, a attack, one could say, globally, but also certainly um, in, in this country. Uh, and in the United States, um, with this raft of legislation uh, limiting uh, voting rights, for example, abortion rights, um, it's a, a, a very serious situation. Uh, and, and not to mention, of course, the, um, the attacks of January 6th, uh, um, uh, 2021. Um, I, I'd just like to sort of take that up just for, for a minute to, to frame our discussion, uh, Tara, and, and say that um, the the, the question of fragmentation has come into a particularly uh, sharp outline in the United States over the you know, recent couple of years. And, and indeed, the last couple of months, there's been increasing talk about the possibility of a second civil war. Um, and there was a call not too long ago in the New York Times, I think it was uh, February 17th, uh, by Jamal Bowie, um, who writes that uh, in a recent poll conducted by the Institute of Politics at Harvard, 35% of voting age Americans under 30 place the odds of a second civil war at 50% or higher. Uh, and in a second result, in another result that says something uh, about the divisions at hand, 52% of Trump voters and 41% of Biden voters said that they, that they at least somewhat agree that it's time to split the country with either red or blue states leaving the union and forming their own country. Um, and this was according to a study uh, conducted by the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia. Insofar as the so-called uh, truckers convoy of protests, um, according to some, uh, was supposed to be our January 6th, um, one also sees a serious level of fragmentation in Canada as well. Um, and so, um, Tara, I think it would be good maybe to, to start with um, a, a question about how you view this, the kind of causes of this fragmentation. There, there are two narratives one could point to. One is that, um, you know, what's largely driving this is a kind of cultural war, say a war of values uh, on the one hand. Um, the other narrative is one of deepening um, socioeconomic uh, inequality um, and the kinds of conflicts that that uh, uh, inequality gives rise to. So um, what do you think about that? Hmm, that's a great place to start. Um, I think, you know, I, I think there's a lot to say. I'm going to start with the warning signals that I'm seeing right now. Um, I'm very concerned about the state of our democracy. And I do look at the U.S. example and uh, both in terms of uh, the struggles that are happening in the U.S. right now and uh, the approaches in terms of media and then also some of the solutions. So I'm looking to a lot of journalists and a lot of depolarization and de-radicalization organizations south of the border for some inspiration on how we in Canada deal with this moment. So I'll tell you what I'm seeing in terms of warning signs. So of course, for democracy to function on a, like a very base level, you need trust. You need trust in institutions and in government. You need trust between the public. Uh, you need an informed public, which is increasingly, increasingly difficult in this era. And then you need uh, the public to feel like their interests are heard and represented in some kind of tangible way. And that um, the politics are productive, the stuff is getting done. And so I see concerns all across all those areas. Um, one of the warning signals that I've been getting uh, quite strongly is, is reader mail. And the mail that I'm getting, uh, is unlike mail I've gotten in my career in that it is really a kind of outlining this affective political polarization. So political polarization, disagreeing with each other because of ideas, affective, coming to despise the other side. And so I'm hearing from people who are having um, just really heated conflicts with people in their lives, uh, fighting with their you know, children and grandchildren and neighbors and friends and you know, relationships ending and very, very stressful kinds of political conversations happening. And you know, that binary, that sort of uh, good versus evil, very simplistic kind of narrative. 
that's one part that I'm seeing. And then when I look at um, the systems in, in this country, uh, you know, anyone looking at the housing crisis, for example, um, which I have a whole chapter in my book about, I don't think anyone could look at housing in this country and think that it's functional, that it's productive, that it's serving the population. You know, just even in the pandemic, we've seen, um, we've seen this sort of insane housing market that was, you know, happening in big cities like Toronto and Vancouver, both of which I've lived in, spread to rural areas. And I'm thinking, you know, just a, a week or two ago, I saw uh, this unremarkable bungalow in Whitby selling for 1.2 million. Uh, people in Whitby are not making that kind of money on average, right? Um, so you see that sort of dysfunction in our systems, billionaire wealth up 68% during the pandemic, uh, precarious labor being a massive issue during the pandemic. Um, and then you see, and I'll just end on this and then, and then actually address the question is that we are seeing a paralysis of government as well. And I think you could really see that um, during the trucker convoy is there was this real paralysis on, on how to address it. And the solution um, that the government came to um, I would argue inflamed the situation and that we heard from Canadian Civil Liberties Association, I interviewed them directly, we heard that this is bypass bypassing the democratic process and that um, sort of intensifying the polarization that we're seeing. So I think I see all of those as contributing factors. What's underlying all of that, I believe, you know, I'm lefty, I believe it's neoliberal economic policies. I believe that's the problem. But, um, but I think all of these factors play into it. Right. Okay. Good. So you have a, um, a situation which itself is 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 very complex. That on one end you have this kind of you know um, moral opposition of good versus evil, an attempt to demonize uh, your uh, your perceived uh, opponents or even enemies. Um, but perhaps this has its roots in uh, some deeper uh, structural causes, which is to say neoliberalism, which means the increasing retreat of a certain kind of role of the state so the last 40 years. So you have a lot of people falling between uh, the cracks. Um, you have a lot of people who can't uh, enter uh, the housing market as owners and are finding it increasingly difficult as renters as well yeah. as rent are, are skyrocketing. But also you, you point to a question of of representation as well. People don't feel as if the government's really uh, representing them. And there's almost a, a deep seated cynicism that enters into uh, civil society, which undermines that sort of trust. Um, and I think one of the things that has sort of emerged alongside of neoliberalism um, in the last, you know, let's say, not quite, it hasn't been quite the, the same history. Uh, so the same length of history of neoliberalism, um, but let's say it's you know the the the, the last twenty years, especially the last thirty years, have been um, increasingly mediated by digital culture. Um, mm. Social media has played an increasing uh, role, and um, it seems that there is a, 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 a really important um, dimension of social media in encouraging uh, and deepening and accelerating um, these sorts of uh, uh, conflicts and indeed contributing to what we're talking about here generally, which is uh, fragmentation. Um, uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Because it seems uh, as we get into the discussion about, about the role of journalism, uh, this is gonna be an increasingly difficult uh, 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 trend to, uh, to, to counteract, which is to say the, um, the easy kinds of answers, the answers that generate the most clicks, which are more heavily um, uh, effective and, and more, let's say, violently inflected, as opposed to the more constructive, the more thoughtful, uh, the more, uh, yeah, let's say complicated sorts of narratives that we, we need to hear and then we need to read. So the social media question. Absolutely. And I, I mean, so much to say on social media. And of course, social media has evolved during my career. I mean, when I started my career, you did not have social media, right? And I think that part of the problem um, is this sort of information environment that we're swimming in right now that has massive amounts of misinformation from a lot of different directions. Uh, this was a huge problem during the pandemic. And sometimes misinformation from official sources too, I should add. So you have this kind of 
massive field of information and, and really difficult for people to navigate. I noticed this during the trucker convoy that it was extremely difficult for people to figure out what was actually happening on the ground because you had these totally polarized uh, narratives, which were, to your point, playing out on social media. It was very difficult to get to some consensus of what the facts were. So this information environment is a problem. It's also a problem for journalism and a really big problem for journalism because journalists are on Twitter all day, every day. This is where the big ideas gets work, get worked out. This is where the narratives get established. And it's, it's really difficult to understand that Twitter is not public opinion, not by a long shot, not by numbers, not by, you know, Twitter is a, is a tiny snapshot and a quite quite ideological one, but that somehow it, it doesn't register for so many of us in journalism because these are the views we're swimming in all day, every day. But there's so, so many views that are left out of that. And that to your point about people feeling like their views are not represented, that drives that. Um, it also drives, as you say, this really inflammatory culture, this culture of dunking, this culture of kind of calling people out, uh, cancel culture as well, kind of takes its root on social media. So there's a lot of destructive forces coming together. And it's, um, as you say, it's going to be a really big issue to overcome. I do think that there are some kind of hopeful signs. Um, I just read a report this week from Minds, uh, the Change Minds Initiative, which is an alternative social media platform. And they're looking at like, how do you work with depolarization? How do you work with de-radicalization on a technical level? I think Substack, um, my experience of Substack is it's, it's a very different environment. You could post the same article on Twitter as you do on Substack and the response will be completely different. Substack seems to sort of slow down the discourse and encourage thoughtfulness. And it somehow I see way more range of views in the comment section there than I will see elsewhere. So I think there's a lot of people experimenting with different things right now. I do think it's a huge, huge problem, social media, huge. Yeah, well, well it seems that social media highlights maybe some of the um, the difficulties and, uh, you know, uh, even one could say the contradictions of this, the the legacy media, um, it has undercut its its business model uh, to to a large extent. And this has yeah. led to um, increasing uh, um, uh, concentration uh, of media, and this doesn't necessarily contribute to a diversity of of, of voices that I think you have have, have, have certainly called for. Um, and it also seems to move in the opposite direction to the sorts of things that Amanda Ridley has, has, has argued for. And I'm just going to quote her. I know you've just recently interviewed her. Um, and uh, she's uh, both a journalist and, and, uh, and, and uh, um, a conflict a mediator and um, has really sought to think about how people with diverse perspectives can, can, can come together and actually speak with one another and, and listen to one another. And uh, she says the following, I think this is really uh, quite fascinating. Um, journalists need to learn to amplify contradictions and widen the lens on paralyzing debates. We need to ask questions that uncover people's motivations. All of us, journalists and non-journalists, could learn to listen better as researchers have established in hundreds of experiments over the, the past half century. The way to counter the kind of tribal prejudice we are seeing is to expose people to the other tribe or new information in ways they can accept. Uh, when conflict is cliche, uh, complexity is, is, is breaking news. Um, it, it would seem to me, I mean, so my question on, on, on this basis would be that with the increasing uh, commodification of, in, of information, the increasing commodification of journalism, it's hyper competitive business model leading to increasing concentration and therefore um, a lack of diversity of perspectives, um, uh, including ideological ones, um, mm -hmm. it, isn't it even more important today to have a viable public broadcaster, um, mm -hmm. such as in this country, can, uh, uh, CBC, um, and it seems that its future is, is, is uh, very much in, in, in doubt. It has been for some time. Uh, especially now with sort of renewed calls uh, by uh, the Conservative Party for its funding to, 
to be pulled and so on. Is there, what role is there in, in, in the country for a kind of public broadcaster where these kinds of approaches to journalism can really be fostered because the pressures of the business model of media are, let's say, relaxed somewhat, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so let me back up a little bit and talk about some of those pressures. Um, but to your to your point about the CBC, I don't support defunding the CBC at all. Um, I, I think the CBC is an incredibly important public institution. And uh, my criticism of it has come from the fact that I love that institution, that it's meant a lot to me as a journalist, as a, as a viewer, and that I think the moment that we're in uh, right now requires, uh, you know, a better public broadcaster. So, but I absolutely do not support defunding the CBC. So, but let's talk about the pressures that are, that are on uh, newsrooms right now. Um, as you say, and this is, this is in the private broadcasters, but it certainly bleeds into public broadcasters as well in terms of institutional pressures. But as you say, social media has taken uh, a ton of advertising away from uh, the media. It has also um, taken a lot of attention away from the media. Um, and it, you know, the other thing that it has done is it has created an army of people who are willing to write and produce content for free. So that devalues our profession right away. Um, and it has uh, led to sort of on Twitter and other places, this idea that, um, that we all kind of know the story before we get to the story, which is something that is really hard to push against as well. So you have a bunch of systemic pressures and you also have the response to those systemic pressures like precarious labor. So uh, if you have people who are on contract or not even on contract, who may have a block of two weeks of producing shifts and don't know what their work is after that, it's not conducive to the kind of arguing you need to do in a newsroom, right? Like you need to pit bias against bias. That's how we come to I don't believe in objectivity, but I do believe in aiming for some kind of neutrality. And in order to do that, you need a collective collaborative search for truth, and you need to be able to argue openly. And if you're not sure about your work status, you're just not going to push back. And um, so the, the other thing that I think is really contributing to all of this is that journalism used to be a working class profession. And it has become an elite profession. And the reasons I think on both sides of the border are different, but in Canada, I, I think it's largely because it is such a precarious uh, industry. It's, it's not easy to make money. It's not easy to get work. It's not easy to build a career. And so it attracts people increasingly who come from more stable backgrounds. Uh, I mean, financially stable backgrounds. And that is, uh, again, an, a certain perspective. And so, if you add to that the pressure on Twitter, if you add to that the sort of pressure on the left right now to conform to certain kind of narratives, that's a lot of pressure converging on a newsroom all at once. And I think it makes it very, very difficult to do, back to your, to your original quote, which is a beautiful quote, and I, I love Amanda Ripley's work so much and uh, have learned a lot from it, is that this sort of um, complexity is sometimes uh, a bit of a hard sell in the environment that we're in right now, and certainly difficult to do in terms of resources, and also um, just a, a difficult task in general, right? I, I'll give you some great examples, I think, of, of it being done really, really well. Um, at Columbia University, there's a sociologist, uh, Musa al Gabri, and he has a column in The Guardian. And he recently did a piece about the vaccine hesitant. And you know, the, along the lines of the left doesn't understand why some people are vac vaccine hesitant, let me go through why. And he did an enormous amount of research. And there were you know, this long list of quite rational reasons why people might be hesitant and really complicated, like digging into the story, doing a ton of interviewing research and coming up with a lot of reasons why people might arrive in that conclusion, as opposed to the narrative that everyone who doesn't get the vaccine is a conspiracy theorist. That's really helpful. It's helpful in a lot of ways. It's helpful for public policy. It's helpful for our society and social co cohesion. It, it's really a helpful exercise. Another example I would point to during the trucker Convoy, really, really hard story to cover. Really hard story. I thought uh, Rupa Subramanya did out, outstanding work on the ground. And part of her um, 
part of her approach was thoroughness. She interviewed almost a hundred people on the ground. And in that incredible thoroughness, you see all the divergent reasons why people are converging on the Capitol. And it doesn't fit the kind of simplistic social media narrative. Again, very helpful. So I think it's a, it's a really, really important thing. This is also uh, quite paradoxical, isn't it? Insofar as there was a lot of hostility um, directed uh, at, at reporters, at journalists, uh, mm -hmm. down on the ground during that protest. And it, yeah. it really echoes something that uh, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos uh, said uh, several years ago, which is um, I know, kind of echoing Trump's message, which is that the, the media are, are the enemy of, uh, of, of the people. So there is this, and I think it relates in a way with what you're talking about in terms of um, the, uh, the the journalistic profession uh, seeming to be more like uh, the elite, and therefore perhaps not asking uh, the kinds of critical questions that they should be uh, asking. Maybe not presenting a, a wide enough uh, um, a, a array of perspectives that they could be. Uh, but nonetheless, there is this incredible hostility, and we say, well, it's it's to journalists as members of a particular class now, but also um, as an institution, right? Uh, journalism as an institution is being uh, uh, rattled like all the other institutions of liberal democracy. And, and this becomes quite uh, quite dangerous. There might be certain people that we, we need to hear from in, uh, you know, in, in that protest, but there are also those at Coots, Alberta, who have, uh, uh, who, who are packing weapons. Um, and maybe their claims to be the excluded and the marginalized are somewhat undermined by the fact that they're receiving embraces by the RCMP. Um, so this is also part of the contradictory nature of, of, of this of, of this protest that um, there is a certain kind of claim to victimhood. But if you look at you know this major institution of, of, of policing in, in, in this country, it's not so clear. There, there are certain levels, I'm not saying across the board, but there's certain forms of, of sympathy um, for uh, you know, those on the far right uh, in, in that protest and, and, and elsewhere. Um, and it seems that there was evidence that there, there were you know, um, former uh, police and military who it, it organized a very, very tight logistics operation yes. for the protest too. This is profoundly troubling, is it not? There's a there's a bunch of things on that. So I um, I am concerned um, for sure. I think that again it's really important to be specific. And so my understanding of the Coots thing and is that there were two camps, and that there was the camp that was the sort of peace and love camp. I believe that those images of the police uh, hugging protesters were from that peace and love camp. And then there was the kind of more hardcore, more religious. Um, driven camp uh, that the arms were uh, retrieved from. So I, I believe that the, those are two slightly different things. Um, and in terms of the, the police participation, um, there has been widespread, like just getting back to the issue of the trucker protest, yep. there has been widespread police uh, opposition to the vaccine mandates all along. So I think that's something also that has to be sort of, and, and really working class, um, opposition to the mandates. Uh, you know, one of the issues with the mandates is they don't recognize natural immunity. And so a lot of frontline workers have been on the front lines the entire pandemic, have gotten sick, have recovered. The mandates don't uh, make allowances for that. <laughs> so I think there's there's a bunch of things. And in terms of the police, uh, how, how do the police treat protesters? This is a really important, important issue. I was very troubled to see uh, the... Uh, horses go into the crowd um, in Ottawa and trample protesters. That was very concerning for me. I also saw a journalist, um, and I believe she was from Rebel News. Now, some people will say that's not a news source, but to me, a journalist is a journalist, you know, getting pepper sprayed in the face and sustaining injuries to her body. These are concerning things. Um, I also think that uh, the level of violence in Ottawa was lower than we see with left-wing protests. And that we need to, instead of saying, why wasn't there more violence in Ottawa, say, 
why can't we hold every protest to that standard? Let's have no violence for anyone. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> Indeed, I fully agree yeah. with you, and I think you're you're, you're right. And it's it's uh, certainly a um, a perilous position for the the left to uh, to be supportive of the invocation of the Emergencies Act. Yes. Uh, but I think that the 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 the, the one group or groups that, that are treated even worse are indigenous uh, first nations uh, we have in in the north of uh, of, of my province bc um, an ongoing uh, uh, conflict uh, between uh, the coastal gas link um, and uh, the traditional leadership of the wet'suwet'en um, uh, uh, people a nation and uh, the the rcmp have been absolutely brutal in 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 their uh, responses in in uh, essentially um, upholding the the BC uh, um, court uh, injunction. So this also has to come into play, and it's often, you know, a matter of um, a, a, again a need for a widened perspective, as yeah. as Ridley has called for. I think this is really crucial. Um, you know, as you know, the, the, the criticisms you make of, of the CBC are are, um, uh, are are apposite. They're 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 important ones to make. But also the widened perspective is well, what about the you know the kind of um, prohibition on using uh, the word uh, Palestine? And you said that the key sorts of issues are, are are not being addressed because of these sort of small identity issues. But that is a key geopolitical issue that shapes so much. Um, so the widened perspective is is, is really crucial. Um, I, I want to get to something that you said that's I think really crucial uh, as well in 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 the contemporary political uh, landscape, and that is that um, it seems that working class concerns um, don't uh, um, resonate uh, so much uh, anymore these days, not least because it seems that, um, uh, you know, traditional working class parties like the Labour Party in Britain, the NDP mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the Democratic Party in the United States since uh, the 1960s, I mean, there has been um, it, uh, it seems a retreat from a representation of working class issues, qua working class issues, right? And, and you had this, I think, magnified by Hillary Clinton in her basket of deplorables uh, <laughs> uh, comment. Uh, um, and, and it seems that that then presents a, a certain opening for, uh, for the right and the far right to try and mobilize the working class. I mean, remember Donald Trump in 2016, uh, was musing about re remaking the, the the GOP into an American Workers Party, mm -hmm. uh, and I found this quite interesting and, and 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 quite terrifying in its own way, given its own sort of nationalist resonances uh, with the past. So I wonder if you could talk about that and how that relates maybe to because you know your your um, uh, um, situating yourself on on the left. How does that relate to yeah. your current position? Well, it's really difficult to talk about the. I mean, I am on the left, and I'm uh, on the left in terms of economic policies as well, um, and have been my whole life. I think it's 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 hard to talk about the left right now because um, we're seeing a bit of a scrambling, as you say. I think the other problem is that the left is not doing a very good job of communicating with the public. It often feels to me like the left is this kind of uh, inside club and that you need to know all of the language and you need to know all of the positions that you need to conform to and that um, that it, it, it's a little bit difficult to decode. And so you have traditional leftists, which I would include myself as, but then you also have this kind of new thing that's happening that I still don't really know how to talk about. And maybe you can help me with this. Um, one of the ways I think about this is Michael Lind uh, and his kind of idea of technocratic neoliberalism, that the you know ruling elite in government, in NGOs, in the media, that in, in Silicon Valley and Hollywood, that it has this new ethos that is center right on economics and, and quite far left on cultural issues. And so people yeah. who are part of this group self-identify as leftists. They see themselves as the left and present themselves as the left, which opens the door for, um, for the right and for centrists to lump all of leftists together into this one pot. And I don't see much attempts to differentiate these different things. And, and I find it quite confusing sometimes. Um, and I think, you know, part of what's happening is that um, 
is that you have these massive winners and losers under globalization, right? And that the parties of the working class um, have kind of abandoned the working class interests. And except that people who are on the left would still like to see themselves on the right side of history. They would still like to see themselves as the good guys. They still care. Um, and so that sort of care and that anxiety and the discomfort about being the big winners in this age is transformed and channeled into this other weird thing. Um, and I don't know what to call that weird thing. I mean, uh, Wesley Yang, whose work I really admire, calls it the successor ideology because it's quite an illiberal perspective and it is succeeding classic liberalism. Um, John McWhorter calls it the elect because it has this kind of religious overtone to it. Um, and he defines that as not the hard left, but the hard left who are me. <laughs> so, um, you know, conservative centrists, heterodox leftists, we'll, we'll call it woke. I often call it woke, but that's not quite the right thing. Um, and then uh, there's another term that I think may be more useful, which is identitarian moralism. And that is a much more fluid thing. You could see that playing out with COVID policy. You could see it now with the situation in Ukraine. Um, but in general, this politics is performative. It is not necessarily tied to the concrete conditions of people's lives. It is not a productive politics. It's not about mass politics. It's not about building coalitions and, and getting um, actual changes, systemic changes made. And that's why I'm very, very critical of the left right now. Um, so I don't know. I mean, how do you define the left right now? Well, I mean, just to, to, to be very brief, I'm, I would say that we could look at this in terms of the left has uh, defined itself in, in terms of a, a pursuit of the ideal of, of equality and um, a, a, a certain understanding of justice, right? And, and I think that what has happened is um, justice defined in terms of the, uh, the, the way um, the fundamental arrangements of society are, uh, are organized has given way to a notion of justice as uh, representation um, and is often symbolic representation. So something like, well, what we demand is that um, around the table of capitalism, we have uh, a diversity uh, of, uh, of, of, of people and of, of genders and, 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 and so on. Um, but we don't necessarily challenge the, uh, the, the, the way that the table is understood. That is to say, the, the fundamental socioeconomic uh, arrangements that exist. We've sort of, get, either we, we, we've given up on that or we never really had that as part of our agenda to begin with. So we want to make sure that, you know, it's, it's about um, inclusion to a, a, a structure that actually, if you look at it, is, is, is fundamentally unjust. But we just have to have, you know, a certain kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, representative equity around that table. And I think this is uh, something that becomes harder and harder to question. And I think it, it becomes harder to question because if you question it, you fall um, uh, afoul of this moral dichotomy of, of, of good versus evil, um, as opposed to, again, that's a simple, simplistic way of looking at the world, whereas uh, politics entails complexity and it entails the sorts of things you're talking about in terms of building alliances and, and, and sharing certain interests in common, but not all interests. Yeah. And indeed, we don't even have to really like each other that much to try and work together to bring about some meaningful change in some aspect of uh, our, our shared social life. Mm -hmm. um, good. So we have a, a, a few minutes left. And, and how do you see things um, uh, uh, moving forward? What do we do? in this um, condition of, of fragmentation um, to, in a sense, try and undo some of the damage. Mm -hmm. So I think about this all the time. I think about it a lot. I talk to a lot of journalists about it. I talk to a lot of thinkers about this. And I think, you know, there's, there are some strategies. Um, I'm, I'm looking a lot at, you know, Braver Angels, a uh, nonpartisan depolarization organization in the States. I look at Amanda Ripley's work. I look at Peter T. Coleman's work in the States. And so I have some sort of strategies that I, that I look at. One is complicating the narrative. I spoke to you a little bit about Musa Al-Gabri's piece and, and how we can sort of dig down and excavate these narratives and try to bring the rich complexity of human life and human experience into that. Um, and then specificity. Uh, so much of the discourse now is sort of knee jerk, big picture. It's about digging down into the details, into the specifics. Um, and then curiosity, I think is a really big one as well. Uh, you know, Ottawa, um, Carleton University in Ottawa had this uh, panel on the 
status of jur journalism. It was called Journalism Under Siege. Um, and there were some really interesting comments on that panel. And I want to draw attention particularly to Jorge Barrera, who is from CBC. And uh, I just had so much respect for how he outlined his approach to dealing with the convoy. And it was about curiosity. And it was also about, I mean, he comes from an evangelical Christian background. He's now able to sort of ex excavate the religious component of this convoy. Um, so I think that this, that, that curiosity piece is really important too. I think that skepticism of Twitter needs to be a big job, number one. And that that same panel, we there was some great comments from Reza Patel at the Toronto Star. She's new to journalism. I mean, imagine coming into journalism and you know you have a, a global pandemic, you have Ukraine, you have a national emergency. This is the whole of her career so far. But she was talking about during the convoy and she's on the ground in Ottawa, looking around on Twitter and seeing some of the way journalists talked about the convoy uh, people on on Twitter and and just kind of sitting back and going, you know, what what if we're wrong? And also, um, what 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 might it be like for someone on that other side to be reading what we're saying? Now that stuff might not make it into the story, but it's out there on Twitter, and it it doesn't it doesn't help. So um, definitely skepticism of Twitter. And then just lastly. I think a, a humanist approach is is really called for right now. It you know the, the idea that uh, just assuming that people are decent until proven otherwise, mm -hmm. and that we might have more in common than not, and that a lot of these uh, bridges are it's possible to you know this week I interviewed uh, Daryl Davis, anti racism activist who has uh, de radicalized more than two hundred KKK members. So there there are. Um, there's some radical work being done out there from a humanist perspective that I think is is great to look to for inspiration. Yeah, great. Well, thanks very much for that. Uh, Amanda, really, I mean, you, you just refer to um, to sort of decentering uh, uh, Twitter and, and she talks about how the um, ability to uh, in, embrace complexity is is correlated with the um, you know the, the kind of complexity of of what people are reading right and I think this is also a really difficult question for for social media because as you say it really is is about um, part of the business model is vying for people's attention. People yeah. have less and less attention to be able to focus on, uh, you know, a, a given articles or given accounts or narratives of, of particular um, uh, events and situations. And so the specificity gets lost. And then we have a kind of flattening again of, yeah. of what actually has happened and what the other side is, is, is saying. So this is, I think, an ongoing, quite a structural um a kind of inbuilt problem now which only seems to 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 be getting worse yes and two thoughts on that um i just interviewed chris hedges um the great chris hedges amazing man incredible journalist and he's written a book about going uh, he teaches in maximum security prisons and has done since 2010 and this latest book the class is about his work with one class writing a play and he does exactly that sort of specificity curiosity complicating the narrative for prisoners who are you know really, I mean, can you think of a population that has been more demonized, more misunderstood, that has been more oversimplified? Um, and what strikes me with what you're saying on that flattening is, um, is so much of journalism during the pandemic has not been done in person, right? So at the beginning of my career, you went out, you went out, and then it became, because of resources and many other things, that you were on the phone. And now it's starting to become, you're just online, you're on Zoom, you're DMing someone for a quote. I mean, this is not how we get to better understanding, right? And it, uh, and, you know, Chris's work, I just thought of that because he's, he's spent since 2010 in the prisons, understanding this really complex issue and these really unique people at the center of it. Yeah, well, I mean that you, you always have another source of flattening when this the, the you know the, the so called cancel culture starts to extend to geopolitics and Russians who explicitly oppose the war Putin's war uh, on Ukraine are themselves being canceled artists and musicians dancers and 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 writers and and uh, and, and journalists. Um, 
surely a, a political view would be we have to support the opposition or potential opposition in Russia um, and, uh, um, you know, while at the same time doing everything we can to, uh, to uh, denounce and challenge uh, Putin's um, uh, uh, war efforts. Sure. But it seems that, again, it's this, this moralization of politics, which is to simply um, tar everybody with the same brush. Absolutely. And one of the concerns that I have in areas of interest in study is, is free speech. And, and on that note, I don't know if you saw that the Russian TV producer who came behind the presenter with the no war sign. Like that's an incredible, incredible act of bravery. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, good. We um, maybe this is a good time to go to uh, uh, questions from the audience and we can also you know, continue our discussion in, in between. So. And do you have a, a question for us? Uh, yeah, and I do want to remi remind attendees, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask a question. Uh, the first question from an attendee, they ask, what is your stance on social media platforms censoring free speech and banning people? What if telecommunication companies eventually parallel that overreach? If they don't like certain conversations people are having over the phone, they deny access to that service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very concerned about social media censorship hugely. Uh, for one, because this is, uh, it's not democratic. They're not elected. That's, that's, not, um, that's not good for a free and open society at all. But also because it, evidence shows it just doesn't work. It, it doesn't achieve the aims that it wants to achieve. If we, you know, if we want less hate speech in society, it's not a in less hateful society in general. It's not useful or productive to, um, deplatform people to send them further into more extreme echo chambers where their views do not meet other views. It's just, it's not productive or useful. And I, I just read a report about this. It, it, it leads to more feelings of victimhood, more feelings of suspicion and threat. And it's, it's, I don't think it's a good way to go at all. Good. Mm -hmm. All right, Ange, um, should we go to the, the next question? Uh, yeah, the next question is from Jonathan, and Jonathan asks, what can legacy media do to combat political polarization? Hmm. I think that's a huge question, and uh, you know, one of the easiest things uh, structurally, one of the easiest structural fixes would be to just stop using precarious labor, like actually hire people, make sure that they have stable jobs, and that you're going to uh, allow those people then to express different viewpoints. And I think that's, that's just like the first and easiest fix. Um, but I also think that, um, I also think that, you know, there's some tough and complex conversations that have to happen in newsrooms in terms of bias and, you know, actively seeking out. I mean, for example, conservative viewpoints, conservative ideas, um, you know, making space for heterodox leftist views, um, seeking out libertarians, you know, trying to um, talk more to rural communities, uh, looking for, you know, religious representation. Uh, I think it's really, really important to focus on all aspects of diversity and all aspects of diversity of viewpoint, and that those need to be like institutional goals and actually institutionalized. I think it raises an interesting question, doesn't it, as well, though, that, you know, in, in a sense, legacy, legacy media did also organize different political uh, perspectives within society. So you have, you know, in, in the UK, you have the uh, archetypical, you know, guardian reader versus, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a London Times reader. You have, you know, the National Post versus, let's say, Toronto Star, and you have different sort of perspectives there. But uh, it, it probably is the case that social media takes those oppositions and turns them into real forms of polarization, which becomes harder and harder to sort of step down from. Well, and it's harder for us as journalists to detach ourselves from that polarization. And particularly, I think there's a real, there's a huge fear of cancel culture. I hear this from journalists all the time. Actually, I hear it from the public all the time. People are terrified of cancel culture. That's one thing. But I think there's also just a fear of, if conflicts are viewed in this black and white uh, moral and evil, you don't want to ever risk being on the side of, of evil. It's so I think that's something that needs to be pulled apart as well. Um, and the other point I would make too is, you know, a group 
you're right that different media represent different political ideologies, but so far I don't see very many media at all representing working class interests. I don't see that and, and particularly platforming working class people. And this is something I've talked to uh, Batya Unger Sargon at Newsweek uh, about quite a bit. And she does a really excellent job of this. She seeks out working class writers and uh, publishes them and, and this sort of diversity of viewpoint. Uh, and, and, from all diverse backgrounds, you, it just really adds so much to the conversation. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I think getting to your point about um, cancellation and, and really the fear of being associated with uh, what had taken to be uh, unpalatable, unpalatable or unsavory views, views mm -hmm. that are you know, beyond the pale. Uh, I know of people, and actually sort of, I, I can give you an example of somebody um, who uh, worked um, of a uh, uh, Chinese Canadian background, so working class, and was actively involved in um, pushing back against the gentrification of Chinatown in, mm. in Vancouver. And, and she happened to uh, like a, a couple of tweets that were uh, uh, taken to be, um, uh, you know, offensive. And there was a campaign that turned out to be successful uh, to um, to deplatform this person, and it, it it was just unbelievable, you know. And it was a deplatforming from, ironically, um, a conference that was supposed to be a large tent uh, and and working class. So you have, I mean, you have these kinds of examples all over the place. And it, it's so corrosive to any possibility of really organizing uh, an effective uh, um, uh, movement that would challenge the existing you know, uh, power structure. Exactly. Are you familiar with Jonathan Rauch with his work? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I interviewed him a while back as well. And it, it one of the things he said to me was he felt that uh, the media had done a decent job, a decent job of the threats to democracy, handling the threats to democracy from the right, but we were still hadn't done a great job on the threats to democracy from the left, that we were not doing the best job on that right now. And I think that's, I, I don't know, I, I have to think about that more, but I, I, I do think that this sort of a liberalism on the left is, is a really big problem. And it's, it's something that people within the left talk about a lot and it needs to be really dressed in a, in a meaty way because as you say you can't get anything done if one tweet gets you kicked out like right and, and some questions of uh, you know of fundamental justice as well challenging the idea of due process which has been yes. very uh, frontally challenged in this country this is extremely dangerous uh, and it's certainly it, it just adds fuel to the fire um so yeah yes. good um, and should we have the next question? Uh, sorry, yes. The next question uh, is from Carolyn. And Carolyn uh, says, complexity, specifics, nuance, and discourse. These are all important things, but democracy requires powerful connective tissue between the members of a polity, and that requires the development and exercise of what is usually called common sense. What kind of common sense does each of you think needs to be part of our struggle to retain and strengthen our democracy? Mm. That's a great question. Samir, do you want to go first? Oh, put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, common sense is, is such an interesting uh, uh, idea. I mean, it, it can be understood in, in two ways. I mean, it can be understood in just a sort of prosaic sense um, uh, of what would a reasonable person do in this situation, right? Which requires a degree of abstraction uh, and sort of putting oneself in place of of, of others, and then coming to some kind of a, a, a conclusion. Um, so it's formally understood in that sense, but it's also understood in, in the, the terms of Antonio Gramsci, who theorized the, um, the idea of, of hegemony, that the, you know, the, the existing power structure uh, rules not just simply by coercion, by way of the police, but also by way of culture. And that culture is embedded into the common sense, that is to say, the, the kind of worldviews that we all sort of carry around uh, with us and, and that's embedded in the way we use language and so on. So it's more substantive, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that um, we have to look at maybe the interaction uh, between those two things and maybe the one, like say the formal one, how do we understand ourselves in, in a more abstract way, how do we understand ourselves by putting 
ourselves in the in the shoes of the other and and to uh imaginatively reconstruct what they might do um has to work against some of the let's say more ideological dimensions of well of course uh the billionaire class deserves a 1.2 trillion dollar increase in 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 their wealth over the pandemic um it's simply what they do and what they deserve right I mean, there are people who, who do think like that. So I think it's about challenging the one with the other. Mm -hmm. Tara, what, do you, what are your thoughts? I, I think it's such a great question and I, I'm really struggling with sense in general right now. I, I feel like there's so much that does not make sense. So I don't know how to start with common sense because I feel like actual, the making sense of society is so imperiled right now. And you know that happened I'm thinking about it sort of with the housing crisis, for example, which has shaped my life profoundly. And I remember coming back to Toronto uh, from Vancouver, and I, I don't know what the numbers are right now, but I, th I think it was something like the, you know, the average one bedroom apartment was like $2,000 a month. And, you know, the median income in the city was like $30,000 a year for individual income. Like these, again, I'm, I'm making these numbers up right now, but it was something like that these numbers just don't make sense. Like it doesn't make sense. And I found that a lot during the pandemic as well with, with certain COVID policy that I was reporting on that just some stuff just does not make sense. And, and, and so that is throughout the whole discourse. And I see that sort of with the free speech issue, you know, that there's not a lot of principles that are being across the board. Like if you are against cancel culture and you are on the right, then you are against Nicole Hannah Jones losing her position. You know, you are against that when it happens on the left. If you were on the left and you were against cancel culture, then you should be, uh, you know, against it for the opposite as well. So I don't see any unifying principles right now that we can judge reality by. And I find it very confusing. I find it a time of no sense. And, you know, I, I'm an analytical person. I need for things to make sense. It wrecks my head. Maybe there's a, a simpler answer for, for both of us, and, and that is that we've we've just spent the last, um, you know, uh, 45 minutes more um, discussing perhaps the absence of a something like a sense that we share in common, and that's yeah. the problem of fragmentation. We don't share that, and that is Im embedded in our institutions in the form of trust, in the form of certain principles, which, I mean, for the left, for myself, are always you know, in, in, in a sense, inadequate, must be transformed, um, show, you know, cracks and crevices, which, which open between what is promised and what is delivered on. But nonetheless, one has to, in a sense, not throw those, throw that baby out with the, the bathwater, but say, well, we need to actually make the institutions of our democracy um, uh, uh, make good on their promises. But we, what we're saying is, that common sense is perhaps part, the, the absence of that common sense is part of the fragmentation that we're talking about. Yeah. What a great point. What a great point. And, you know, maybe the way forward is, is the collective making of meaning again, right? And part of the problem is we've not all been face to face. We haven't been able to do this. Um, and, you know, doing it right here on a virtual platform is a, is a good first step, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, Ash, next, next question. Uh, the next question is from Nadia. Uh, Nadia says, Samir, you have written about fascism. Do you see the growing polarization, turning complexity into simplistic moral differences as being a precursor and facilitator of a turn towards fascism? Uh, I, I think this would be um, a necessary, although not a sufficient condition uh, for fascism. Um, just listening to Timothy Schneider this morning uh, on Ezra Klein's uh, podcast at, at, the, at the New York Times. And um, this is a, a really a terrific discussion if you have an opportunity to listen to it in terms of pointing to the way in which Putin is providing uh, this mystical justification for uh, his actions in Ukraine. So it's you know, let's not just think of this in terms of kind of geopolitical security concerns, in terms of the uh, the um, uh, expansion uh, uh, eastward of NATO. Uh, that is a dimension to this, but it really is a kind of deep-seated underlying um, uh, uh, politics of identity in a certain sense, of kind of Russian uh, identity that would uh, be a collective one that could ground uh, his actions, however seemingly 
irrational, right? However, seemingly self-contradictory, you know, for example, bringing the United States and NATO closer together, is hardening Ukraine's resolve to be part of, of the West and not part of the East, et cetera. And I think this is a, a, a great example of, of reducing um, uh, complexity by a very simple, let's say mythological um, uh, appeal. And the question then would be, do we see other such uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, logics and dynamics? Could we understand Trump's appeal to making America great again in a similar sort of uh, way? What we see in India, you know, in, in terms of Modi's appeal to kind of Hindu nationalism, um, I think one could see some real, it, really interesting um, uh, family resemblances here. Um, thanks for the question. Um, and yeah, so next one, please. I, unless Tara, do you want to add anything to that? Do you have anything? Um, to I don't know a lot about fascism, so I was I was actually really interested, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on that as well, and to ask you more about that later. And I, I, I also kind of have been thinking a lot about populism, and and how we understand populism, and sort of speaking of Trump, I I think um, I interviewed some authors who wrote a book called Reclaiming Populism just this week. And one of the really interesting, they did a lot of statistical analysis on, one of the things they found was that uh, really the sort of biggest correlation between populism is economic unfairness, particularly social mobility. And I think that's a really important thing to think about as we kind of look at these waves of populism going on around the world, that this idea of anti-elitism and, um, and that this, the, the idea that, societies are rigged is has some truth behind it in a lot of places and that it you know that we we have this choice to make on whether we dismiss these concerns uh, whether we use rhetoric to um, condemn these people or whether we listen to the concerns uh, because we want a healthier society and we know that that's going to require public policy adjustments mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that's really interesting. Um, the question of fairness, it, it's also how how fairness is is defined, of course, mm -hmm. and what are the sources of unfairness. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, um, you know, for me, uh, the, the bottom line in differentiating, and I think we can differentiate between a kind of right wing authoritarian populism and a, and a left wing uh, form of populism is in terms of how we understand questions of fairness and unfairness. So, um, mm. you know, for the left, um, it is the opposition between the 1% and the 99, right? Quote, unquote, <laughs> or, you know, the many and not the few as, as, as Corbyn um, put it when he was leader of the, uh, the Labour Party. Um, so it's an attempt to really understand the socioeconomic um, nature of, of the unfairness. It's the structure of, you know, a, a neoliberal capitalism, as, as you pointed out. I think the, the left populists would agree with this. Um, the right tends to say, well, it's not really the, the, the structure of capitalism per se, but it's rather, you know, uh, historically it's been, it's the Jews. Um, now it's, you know, the migrants, it's the refugees, it's um, the scroungers, those who, you know, don't want to work, they're the ones who are responsible for this unfairness. And I think that what gets sort of tied in here is, is also um, a certain cultural determination, right? It's a, you know, it's this culture war. It's, it's um, you know, the, the politically correct and the, you know, the identitarians who are forcing upon us um, a, uh, uh, a kind of an elitist worldview that's that is inimical to how we understand ourselves in our you know say Christian communities or orthodox orthodox Jewish um, communities and and so on. So there's a sort of resurgent traditionalism here. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's a fundamental um, uh, distinction that that needs to be made. And that's why I asked about you know do we principally focus on the culture war yeah. or do we focus on the, those sources of socioeconomic inequality at, at, per se and try and you yeah. Know, so I wonder, I wonder if those definitions are now getting scrambled with the left and right getting scrambled. I, you know, I, I've, I've interviewed Trump supporters and uh, when I was at CDC and uh, I didn't, 
I didn't hear those concerns that you just phrased. And I've interviewed populists now in Canada, and I also didn't, I didn't hear the, the sort of xenophobia that you're um, referring. I'm not saying that that's not there. I've read lots about that, but I, I haven't seen evidence of that in, in interviews. What I have seen is, is, um, is the populism in this country really phrasing uh, itself around economic concerns, but not in the language of the left. There's a more libertarian bent to it than there is. Uh, the left wants trad traditional kind of structural unions and negotiating wages. And, and this sort of populist wave is, is wanting government out of their lives. But the actual under underpinning conditions that people are expressing um, their dissatisfaction with are, are economic and structural. That's what I'm hearing. So mm -hmm. I think I think there's a scrambling in terms of right left on that right now too. And again, back to the specificity of you know the specific individuals, their specific concerns. I think there's a huge range of concerns and that that many of them are warranted. I am also going to say very concerned about the far right. I don't want to see, you know, xenophobia and racism, those kinds of things in our society, which is why I think we have to be very conscious and careful to, um, to really pay attention to what the conditional concerns are and to address those concerns and not push people in illiberal directions. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just a last point about uh, what, what you say there and your, your concerns, and it ties back directly into what we've been discussing this um, uh, this past uh, uh, hour or so, and that is uh, the, 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 the notion of a, a, a crisis of liberal democracy is a, a definition I use in, in, in the book by Samir, Samir Amin, who is a, an Egyptian uh, political economist and who, who defines fascism in terms of um, a um, categorical rejection of liberal democracy when uh, in, under conditions of capitalist crisis uh, mm -hmm. and in the name of uh, a, um, a, a kind of collectivity that's embodied in a particular uh, a leader who sort of personifies that collectivity, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, the, you know, a number of those features can be said to be present. Um, and I think, yes, there's this, there's, there are these libertarian dimensions, but there's also, and often in a contradictory way alongside of those, libertarian dimensions, this underlying demographic fear, right? And you get this mm -hmm. in, the, you know, in the Charlottesville uh, protests, that infamous march, you know, Jews will not re replace us. Um, mm -hmm. This idea of, uh, you know, the, the great replacement, um, uh, mm -hmm. the idea of the, you know, the, 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 you know, the white population is, is being increasingly overwhelmed by uh, by immigration and by illegal uh, immigration. And this is something that has to be stopped. So mm -hmm. and the two sit, sit alongside of one another. And so mm -hmm. there's an increasing propensity to start to shut down the um, uh, and, and, and undermine the structures of, of, of liberal democracy. Yeah, and this yeah. Is very, very troubling. So it's not just sort of fragmentation that, that is sort of, you know, more or less anarchic, pu pu pushing and pulling in its own way, but rather a concerted attack on, on those institutions. And we saw that most symbolically with January 6th. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we should all be quite concerned about this. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm a little distracted because you're hearing my dog barking in the background oh. at someone at the door. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right, let's go to the next question, please, Ange. Uh, yeah, the next question is from Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn says, hello, and thank you both. Uh, I see democracy as so fundamentally economic and political. I don't know why we are not having more of a parallel dialogue of democratic economics and political de democracy. Also, I see democracy starting with each of us personally and would welcome more discussion about applying democratic principles interpersonally and interpersonally spreading outward. Do you have thoughts on this? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think interpersonally is important. I think, you know, the first principle that everyone deserves a voice and deserves to be heard and listened to. I think part of the issue that we are at in this present moment is the focus on the interpersonal, is the focus on the individual and the internal. And uh, that the focus for me needs to be more external and collective and communal and coming to kind of collaborative solutions to these big systemic changes. I feel a bit, um skeptical about 
what can be accomplished on an individual level. And that may be just the moment that we are in history. It, it may be some of my disillusionment, but I, I feel a bit skeptical about what can be um, accomplished in the interpersonal realm. And I think we've seen that a lot of politics in the last 10 years is kind of focused on the interpersonal realm. Uh, and I, I think it needs to be more on the collective. What do you think, Samir? Yeah, well, I, I wonder about that. And, and um, I, I'd like to, um, yeah, push this a little bit further and say, well, yeah, I mean, you know, we can't just look to um, an individualistic mode uh, of, of politics. Uh, we have to situate the individual within uh, communities and within larger uh, collectivities. Um, but there is a kind of a relationship, isn't there, in, in so far as um, the individual needs to be part of uh, those, those larger groups and collectivities, um, but ought not to be sacrificed to them. At the same time, the individual shouldn't be, in a sense, fetishized or, 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 or prioritized over them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that at, at, in any discussion of, of democracy, there must be um, a certain capacity on, on the part of the individual to uh, listen to the other and to be able to engage seriously with the other. Um, one of the things that, that uh, didn't come into the discussion of common sense is a sort of third un understanding that comes from Hannah Arendt, who, who draws this, this, this notion from um, uh, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, um, who wrote a book on uh, the, um, the nature of aesthetic judgment. And, and she said, basically, aesthetic judgment is premised upon um, a sensus communis, so a, a common sensibility. And one of the, the, the dimensions of this is a kind of enlarged mentality, right? And Arendt was an important theorist of totalitarianism. She wrote about uh, Adolf Eichmann and, and uh, the finality of evil, but also theorized what is it like to uh, be in a, a, a kind of space of, uh, of political action, right? Mm -hmm. and, that an important dimension of that space of political action is to be able to um, not just arrive at a, a kind of particularistic understanding of oneself, neither is it to sacrifice yourself to the larger collectivity, but to hold these in, into some kind of a, a, a attention. It seems from all that we've said that such a possibility seems to be retreating ever and ever further uh, away, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, what do you think about that? I mean, some notion of, you know, being able to engage with, with one another um, uh, seriously, but not just in terms of giving and taking, uh, you know, uh, reasons and arguments, mm -hmm. but there's got to be something else. We have to, I, I like what you said earlier, very much, you know, kind of collective meaning-making practices, because for our end, meaning was at the center uh, of, of politics. We rely on a, a shared world, she calls it, right? And those, that, 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 that world is a world of, of shared sort of intertwined meanings. Mm -hmm. right? um, so I'd be interested to hear what you, what you think about that in terms of how this relates to your work specifically as, as a journalist, because what was important for Arendt was storytelling, was mm -hmm. narrative, um, and it seems that it's not just the, you know, the writers of fiction and, and, and poetry these days, but, and, and of course, filmmakers, uh, but also journalists who contribute to these sort of meaning making practices, they, uh, they convey some of the key uh, narratives. Now, those narratives can either be extremely thin, or they can be thicker and, and more encompassing to, to draw you know, a wider range of people in. Um, so maybe I'd be interested to hear what you think about that, that sort of maybe essentially expanding on this notion of collective meaning making practices and, and what, you know, what role journalism has to play in this. Yeah, so there's a, there's a great book on this called I Never Thought of It This Way by Monica Guzman. It just came out and uh, Seattle journalist. And uh, I spoke to her in my podcast recently and what really kind of, stands out to me is her just great joy and delight in interviewing. And it really stands out because that's how I feel. I love people. I love talking to people. I love hearing people's stories. And the thing is, when you're interviewing people, you realize 
um, how frequently people surprise you that the, the, the narratives never hold. It's never what you expect. People are so unique with such different life experiences and different perspectives and surprising opinions and, and um, sort of delightful conclusions. And that so much of, um, you know, and troubling, troubling, uh, troubling experiences and pain and grief and all of those things. And that, you know, most people, uh, I think it's a fundamental human need to express ourselves and a fundamental human need to be heard. In the same way, I also think it's a fundamental need to hear other people and to connect on that human level. And that that is to me like the, not to sound corny, but like the, absolutely the great joy of my life is how much I love people and conversation. And that the process of journalism, I think is, is about that. It's about the art and the practice and the trade really, you know, the skill, the craft, I don't know how you talk about it, but of trying to listen deeply and reflect what we hear and honor you know, that human experience of kind of communion around that. And that through that experience, I think great social change can happen. I do. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think that's what I would say on that. And I think that, that there's a lot of practices for that, 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 you know, that are kind of falling by the way said, I think a lot about uh, Matt Taibbi, the American journalist who I, who I think is fantastic. And his father was a TV reporter and his father would get home every night and um, make a drink and go sit in the living room and make phone calls. And he wasn't on a story. He was just calling sources and talking and that that was his nightly practice. And in, in this kind of sped up media environment where we're, you know, at CBC, we do two stories a day, every day, if you're a current affairs producer, your stories fall through, it might be three or on a terrible day four. Um, it doesn't leave that room to breathe. I mean, I, I think about that a lot of like sitting back with a drink and spending an hour on the phone with a source for no reason at all. And the kind of stories and understanding that would come out of that. It's a, it's a different era and we have to find a way to bring that into the future. Yeah, uh, but you're not also just dealing with this specific environment of, uh, of, of social media, but you also have, you know, you know, uh, outlets like Fox News, or TV media, uh, Fox News that are really, um, you know, quite toxic in, in, in what they're presenting and in some way under the guise of uh, of representing what you know the the real men and and and, and woman thinks uh, on on the street. Um, I mean, it's interesting that uh, RT has uh, has essentially been pulled from uh, many car carriers throughout uh, uh, North America. Um, but you could argue that well, what what RT has has done, they actually you know they they run a, a great show uh, uh, by by Chris Hedges, right? Mm. Um, but you have you have Fox maintaining its position and arguably in, in a you know in a much more has a much more toxic kind of effect on uh, on the public sphere. When you say, well, I think these things are very complicated. I mean, I uh, Matt Taibbi has a great book called ha Hate Inc. And yeah. he's he's basically saying that Fox and MSNBC are just the polar opposites. It's the same business model. And so if we're going to criticize Fox, I think we to be fair, we have to criticize MSNBC. Right. Um, yeah, and that yeah. both are rife with assumptions and, you know, uh, so I, th I think they're both equally talk. I'm well, I think they're both very toxic. <laughs> and, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, good. All right, let's get to uh, the next question, please, Ange. Okay, uh, the next question uh, is from an attendee. Uh, the attendee asks Tara, before you published your exit essay about leaving CBC, what kind of reaction were you anticipating? And how do you view how your, la how your essay landed? Hmm. It's a great question. And let me just back up for one moment on the Fox News MSNBC thing. And to complicate it further, there's great journalists at both of those networks. So this is this it's a complex, complex situation. So but uh, moving forward to my essay, um, I to be completely honest, I thought the essay would be ignored. Um, I have published controversial things before. Uh, one of the ways that Canadian media functions sometimes is if you really push the envelope, things get ignored. And so a big part of me expected it just to get ignored. Um, I did it because I thought about it for a very long time because I thought it was a really important conversation. I waited and waited for someone else to start it. I didn't know if it would happen if I didn't do it. 
And I felt like it was a really important uh, conversation that we have as a country. And in terms of how it landed, it's been very interesting. Um, I've never sort of experienced anything like this before. I've never had something go viral to that extent. It is a very, very strange experience, particularly for the first week. I, you know, it's a very, very strange experience to, um, to have, basically to have that many people wanting to talk to you all at once. It's just kind of an around the clock um, overload on your senses. Um, I found, it really uh, interesting and that I heard from a ton of journalists across North America. I heard a lot from the public, which was really interesting. And in terms of making sense and meaning, it really helped me to solidify some of my thinking. I found um, some of the response from like a very small group on Twitter really um, reaffirmed the arguments that I was trying to make, you know, that, um, there was just some quite outlandish claims made, you know, that that I didn't actually work at CBC, for example, and that I wasn't a current affairs producer and, um, you know, that I didn't care about housing because I wasn't tweeting about it. Never, never mind that I have a whole chapter in my book um, that these things were quite easily verifiable. And I found that conversation very strange to be in the center of. I, I just had a tweet last week, um, you know, asking me basically if, if I had been employed by the CBC, which really surprised me. So I think, um, you know, just backing up for people who may be new to the conversation, this was my resignation letter from CBC. I went through sort of my critiques of the CBC and this uh, letter went quite far and wide. And um, so I found, I found a lot of the response uh, on the critical side quite uh, affirming of my arguments that the ideology comes before fact sometimes in these kind of uh, conversations. And I think, um, you know, the response was overwhelmingly positive. And now that I'm at Substack, I've been sort of going through and doing the stories that really, um, really matter to me. And one of those was the vaccine mandates. And the vaccine mandates was one of the reasons uh, why I felt so compelled to go independent. I was really, really worried that we were not um, having a, a fulsome public conversation about that issue. And I, I, I felt like that was a, quite an explosive issue. And the first piece I did was with um, Dion Polar, a uh, Canadian social scientist who uh, went through some of the kind of legal, uh, you know, whether the vaccine mandates will stand up to this reasonableness uh, guide in terms of uh, legal arbitration. And um, that came out as the truckers were driving across the country and that the sort of what went on after that uh, really to me epitomize what happens when you don't have a fulsome public conversation on a really, really important public policy issue like this. I think that, um, that the vaccine mandate is, is, is a huge, huge issue and one that I really, really wanted to cover. So anyways, I hope that all answers your question. It's been quite an interesting thing to be in the middle of, and um, I'm very happy to be at Substack now. Great. So we have uh, time for the last couple of questions, and I think we'll um, be at the end of our, our period. So, uh, Ange, next question, please. Uh, yeah, the next question is from Jamal. Uh, Jamal says, has the rise of identity politics, despite its stated concern, concern with equity, actually contributed to the polarization and fragmentation of society that undermines equity and equality? Well, I'm very, I'm very critical of identity politics. Um, and I, I think there's so many things kind of happening simultaneously with that. I, I worry, there's a, there's a film that really had a huge impact on me, uh, Eli Steele, filmmaker in the States. Uh, and he is black um, and First Nations and Jewish and also deaf. Um, and he does this film called How Jack Became Black. And it's about his son who is multiracial having to check, check a box to be enrolled in the LA public school system. And he goes on this journey looking at where identity politics come from and the sort of uh, disasters that uh, identity politics have led to in the past in history and then in his own life as well. And I, I just became really, after seeing that film and I had already been really thinking a lot about this and just, you know, once you, 
once you open the box to that kind of racial thinking, I'm just not sure that you get to choose where it goes. And I suspect that the people who suffer the most are minorities in that scenario. I think it's a really scary Pandora's box to open. And, um, and you know, I also, I think about it in terms of the Me Too movement and, and how uh, we've seen the sort of identities that are, um, I don't know if you wanna say, fashionable it's not the right word but that that you know whose voice is valued shifts all the time and that I'm not sure I want to live in a society where rights are contingent on fashion like that I would like us all to have them so that that's that, that that's not an issue and um yeah I think it can be very very destructive I hear from uh, a lot of writers and thinkers who are people of color who find it uh very oppressive the sort of um assumptions that are made with identity politics that uh, there's a sort of diminishing of individualism and individual experience and individual politics and uniqueness of experience. And um, I, I, I really worry about it. Um, Samir, what are your thoughts? Uh, just a quick point to reinforce uh, one of the things you said, and that is that uh, uh, my daughter, who's uh, mixed race, was uh, asked to leave uh, a BIPOC safe space uh, and so I was quite outraged uh, by all this. She she was you know fairly uh, uh, you know uh, unbothered by it, but I thought it was just you know outrageous that this could happen. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of problems. There. All right, good. I think we have uh, time for one last question. Okay, uh, the last question. Uh, many many workers feel they are being used by their employers due to wages that cannot afford them a living, which is a basic necessity. So, how can they trust a society that is supposed to be democratic? Mm -hmm. It's a it's a really good point, and this is something that you know back to the identity politics thing um, that I think is a real failure of the left, and it, it, it part of why it's such a non starter at the ballot box is if you go out to a group of people whose wages have been stagnant since 1975, <laughs> who can't afford you know to rent an apartment like a a 400 square foot apartment, let alone buy a house, and you know are working precarious gig sort of. Uh, you know, positions and then lead with, with, you know, white privilege arguments. It's, I, I just think it's a non-starter. And I think, as you say, that the real issue here is economics, which affects all of us across all classes and races and backgrounds. And so I think that um, the work issue is a really important one. It's one I've thought about a lot. I think we have an epidemic of unpaid overtime in this culture that is uh, exhausting us. <laughs> so that most people don't have the capacity to uh, be involved in inquiry, let alone political action. So I think there's so much to unpack there, but it's bang on. The, the working conditions are not good right now. The economics are not good for the vast majority of people. Great, I think you know, this relates very much to the, um, the last question. I don't know if we have time for that, Ange. Um, it's quite a long quote from uh, Hannah Arendt's uh, human condition it's, it's very very interesting but i think we are now um at the uh end of um our event and uh i'll, I'll pass the uh the floor back over to jim well thank you very much samir and i want to thank you and and tara for a really engaging complex discussion i wish we had more time I, any number of the questions that came up could be the focus of a, a much longer discussion. And, and in a sense, that's the point of the Center for Free Expression, our events to help point out how complex things are in an era of fragmentation and simplification and polarization. We need to get beyond that as, as I think you both so eloquently talked about it in various ways. So thank you both very much. And thank you to the audience for joining us today and for your questions. A video of today's uh, conversation will be posted on the Center for Free Expression website tomorrow, as well as a list of resources for those of you who might like to look more into any aspect of this and several of the uh, podcasts or videos or books or articles that uh, Tara and Samir mentioned will be listed there. Uh, so uh, it, I hope you'll find it a useful resource. And if you have others who you think would would enjoy this conversation, please draw their attention to it. Our website address is cfe.ryerson.ca. Our next event is going to be two weeks from tomorrow. It's going to be on Wednesday, March 30th. 
and it's going to another aspect that's really important for democracy, and that is the public's access to information. And one of the biggest barriers in our present access to information regime in Canada is an exclusion for what's called cabinet secrecy. And some governments treat cabinet secrecy as a giant black hole into which anything that's come within a remote distance of the cabinet can be claimed to be a cabinet secret. Uh, and there's a case that just went through the Ontario Court of Appeal where the Ford government in Ontario refused to release the premier's mandate letters to the ministers because they were cabinet secrets. Now, every other government in the, in the country, they release them so the public knows what the minister, what the priorities of the government are, but it's just an extreme form. And so a very interesting book has written, been written by a professor of law at the University of Ottawa named Jan Capagnola uh, entitled, Does Cabinet Secrecy Unduly Undermine Open Government and the Public's Right to Know? And so this can be a book launch for his book. And interestingly, he's going to be in discussion with one of the most impressive and important civil servants in, in the last 40 years, Mel Cap, who was a former clerk of the Privy Council of Canada and secretary to the cabinet. So it should be a really fascinating discussion. So that will be uh, two weeks from tomorrow on Wednesday, March 30th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. I hope you'll uh, tune in for that. And the details are on the CFE website, cfe.ryerson.ca. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hope to see you again. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks for coming.